Hello, everybody. Um, as we wait for um, the rest of the attendees to join, I'll just go ahead and get started with a few logistics. My name is Leila Subani from the Center for Educational Equity. To the returning Mending Democracy attendees, welcome back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're happy to have you. We've made it to our last session of the series, and so I just wanted to thank you all for your continued support. Your input is valuable, so please engage with one another and with the panelists in the chat box. If you have specific questions for the panelists or for our moderator, please use the question and answer function where you have the option to submit your questions anonymously if you do choose to do so. If you are directing your question to someone in particular, please be sure to indicate that as well. These sessions are recorded and they can be found on our Democracy Ready New York website, www.democracyreadyny.org. And finally, at the end of the session, you'll have another opportunity to provide input through a survey that will pop up in your browser and it will be sent out in a follow-up email. So let's go ahead and begin. We have Shira Epstein. Welcome to the culminating session of Democracy Ready New York's webinar series on teaching civic readiness. I'm Shira Epstein, Associate Professor and Program Director of Social Studies Education at the City College of New York. I'm thankful for this opportunity to give introductory remarks about the series as a whole, Democracy Ready New York, and the importance of all of our work to make young people's right to civic readiness a reality. First, about the series. Each Thursday for the month of March, hundreds of participants have gathered to learn about essential components of civic education. We opened with a session on media literacy, given the necessity of discerning reliable from misleading information in today's world. The following week, we turned to the topic of discussing controversial issues and how youth can dialogue on contentious topics with reason. And just last week, we learned what it looks like for young people to directly address public problems and take action to improve people's lives. Across the series, teachers, youth workers, researchers, policymakers, and young people offered advice that was wise, motivating, and grounded in real experience. They helped expand our vision of civic readiness. Now, a bit about Democracy Ready New York, the host of the series. Democracy Ready New York is a relatively new statewide coalition of which I'm honored to be a part. Similar to the diversity of panelists in the webinars, Democracy Ready New York is comprised of multiple groups and individuals, education groups, civic groups, as well as scholars and youth leaders. The aim of the coalition is to work together and with the regions to make civic preparation a reality in New York schools. Our coalition is guided by a vision of young people experiencing multiple opportunities for civic participation. Imagine youth receiving continuous and overlapping invitations from people in their lives to get civically involved. Hey, have you heard about fill in civic question or issue? What do you think? What should we do about this? Then imagine what young people's civic involvement could look like. It could be informed steeped in knowledge of history, government, and the needs of the, of the current day. Their civic involvement could be skillfully executed through the use of critical reading, argumentative writing and speaking, deliberative practice, and coalition building. And their civic involvement could center authentic experience where they address real issues in their classrooms, schools, and beyond. Imagine young people entering adult civic life having been involved in these ways. They would be ready to cast informed votes, help in their communities, or join or organize a campaign. Please ask yourself what you can do to advance this vision. What role can you play in your communities to ensure that all youth get these invitations, these opportunities to develop civic readiness? This is an all hands on deck moment. As we know, this vision is not a reality. Our education system has neglected the teaching of civic readiness. Young people are ready for supportive entry into civic life, but there aren't enough ways to engage. 
Organized civic learning opportunities are particularly hard to find in rural, urban, and low-income schools, exacerbating long-standing political and civic inequities informed by class, race, and level of education. Take these trends and add what more recent events have confirmed for us, and we know we have a problem. Namely, the events of January 6 illustrate America's vulnerability to misinformation, lack of trust in government, and ignorance of constitutional and democratic values. There is a way forward. The New York Court of Appeals, our state's highest court, has recognized that all students in the state have a right to an education that prepares them to be productive, productive civic participants. The Board of Regents has begun taking steps to implement this right, including the appointing of a task force to develop concrete proposals. And more generally, dialogue in multiple sectors and in the media shows that people are calling for change. And we gain hope from this webinar series itself. We came together to develop more shared knowledge about what civic readiness looks like and why it is important. Today's panel will point us to the future. Can the state prioritize civic readiness for all students with so many critical challenges facing schools in the coming years? How do New York's ongoing inequities in school funding and educational opportunity affect schools' ability to prepare their students for civic participation? Many people made these panels possible. So before we turn to these critical questions and our final session, I have some people to thank. Teachers College, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, Margaret Perman of Real Design Associates, Jeff Heckelman, Center for Educational Equity staff, Leila Subani, Anne Lobu, Artie Doshi, and Jessica Wolf, and all the Democracy Ready New York Coalition members who helped develop the series. I'm now thrilled to turn the mic to Professor Stephanie Rowley, Teachers College Provost, Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs and Professor of Psychology and Education, who will moderate our conversation with leaders and decision makers. Thank you, Layla. <laughs> Sorry, Shira. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the culminating webinar in the series, Mending the Fabric of Democracy teaching civic readiness. I have so enjoyed watching the others in the series and really look forward to today's conversation. My own research, especially in recent years, has focused on the connection between school curricula and parental socialization on the one hand and student civic attitudes and engagement and activism on the other. My work shows that both parents and schools are critical sources of information about how social and political systems work and students armed with knowledge of the history and functions of these systems are inspired to get involved in their own communities. Thus, access to high quality civic engagement, civic education is critical to developing an engaged citizen, citizenry and for community uplift. At Teachers College, we aim to create partnerships for a smarter, healthier, more equitable and just world. And so we're proud to be part of this important effort to promote civic readiness for all New York students. Our amazing panelists for today are leaders who can shape how we move forward to prepare students for civic participation. We're looking forward to hearing their ideas and responses to the recommendations for action made in the preceding webinars. Tracy Jordan is a public school parent leader, an attorney and graduate student in educational psychology. Tracy immigrated from Barbados as a child and attended school in Flatbush, Brooklyn. She's now raising her six-year-old daughter in the same Brooklyn school district where she's an active parent association board member and works with the Alliance for Quality Education as an education warrior. Shelley Mayer has served in the New York State Senate since April 2018, representing the 37th district in Westchester. She's currently chair of the Senate Education Committee. Prior to the Senate, she served in the State Assembly for six years. Senator Mayer has been a champion for education issues and public schools throughout her time in the state legislature. Michael Rebell is professor of law and education practice at Teachers College and executive director of the Center for Educational Equity, 
which convenes Democracy Ready New York. He's a renowned education law scholar and litigator known for CFE versus state, the landmark school funding case, and more recently, Cook versus Raimondo, a case that seeks to establish a right to education for civic participation under the US Constitution. Dr. Betty A. Rosa is, a is the Commissioner of Education and President of the University of the State of New York. She's the first Latina to serve in the position. Before becoming commissioner, Dr. Rosa served as chancellor of the Board of Regents, where she had been the regent for the Bronx County since 2008. She is a nationally recognized education leader with more than 30 years of instructional and administrative experience. Edward Sanchez is a senior at Fort Hamilton High, High School in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. He's a Citizens Committee for Children's Youth Action member, advocating for educational equity and youth opportunities, like summer employment and after school programs. He's also part of the Democracy Ready New York Youth led funded New York campaign, calling for increased education funding. And Jennifer Wolf is the 2021 New York State Teacher of the Year and has been teaching social studies for 24 years. She currently teaches high school history and government in Oceanside, New York. The first national board certified teacher there, she encourages her colleagues to become leaders and change agents in their classrooms, their districts and their profession. Welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, so before we get to our questions for the panel, we're gonna listen to some New York students discussing civic learning opportunities. This is what democracy looks like. How important is media literacy to a student becoming a good critical thinker and more civically engaged in their community in general? Just in Everyday life, you need to learn how to research proper things. If you want to participate in our democracy or any democracy, you need to be educated to kind of participate in that. When you're online, there's a lot of things that you kind of have to tell from the world of fake, especially in articles. I actually took a class last year that was based solely on how to do proper research. And it was an elective course, and I sort of wish it was more something that everyone got to partake in. And when you say you'd like uh, topics that sort of don't have a necessarily correct answer, what kind of topics would those include? Like we normally learn about issues in history. I think what we should be talking about is how we can prevent us from repeating those mistakes. It just emphasizes the importance of helping to encourage critical thinking with students so that we can sort of analyze solutions, like you said, and ways to improve the society that we live in. Have you had classes that did in-depth lessons on how to do proper research and how to like vet sources? My English class had dedicated a whole unit to media literacy, where we essentially just went over like how to know if a source is credible and like how to form opinions based on that it helped some people like you could tell from like that point on that people were at least a little more thoughtful about what kind of articles they'd read why do you think it's important that students be civic ready in our democracy and just be prepared in schools to be civic ready um ed just so they can uh participate in this democracy at all you you won't get very far if you're not like literate um, Lennon, your thoughts? Like last year, I was in this, like I said earlier, the kids' council. And if you're a citizen in school, you grow up learning how to be a citizen in other places and in the real world. I think being able to be an active participant in your school community will then make it so that it's much easier for you to make the transition to being an active citizen in your regular community and even in your state. 
and in the nation as a whole. It goes from when you're a child to when you grow up. So you never stop being a citizen. And I think that's something that should be encouraged in schools, whether it be through activism, critical thinking, media literacy, all of these things are very important to the development of students. In America, I'm glad to be in a democracy where I have freedom of speech and I can speak what's on my mind. I think it's really important that we have more discussions like this because, you know, again, this is like, this is kind of what bare bones democracy is, you know, everyone being heard out. And I think it's important. Incredible youth. So, Commissioner Rosa, it's such an honor to be here on the screen with you. Uh, you've been involved in moving the state toward the goal of civic readiness for all students with so many critical challenges facing New York schools in the coming years. We have pandemic recovery, uh, we have racial justice, widespread vulnerability to misinformation that we just heard from the students, heard about from the students. Why have you made this a priority and how? And then second, can you describe what the state has accomplished to date? Sure, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And, and as always, leading with our students is always uh, a symbol of what this work is all about. So thank you for that. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna say that we have been working on this issue um, all the way back from, not only in terms of our ESSA plan, because if you look at our ESSA plan, we have college, career, and civic readiness. So we included the three C's as part of our priorities. Uh, and when I say our prior priorities, I'm talking about both the Board of Regents, the department, and I know, I also know it's a priorities, uh, it's a priority for many of our stakeholders and our legislators. We see this as a method of empowering our students. We see it as young people getting involved, affirming the issue of cultural identities and also um, making sure that schools are powerful places and landscape where our students learn lessons that they know that they are a part of, and they really begin to create these constructs to be civically involved in many of the decision-making. It is an empowering process for our youth. And as the young student said, you start early knowing the issue of understanding our democracy, understanding our involvement, giving voice to student actions. And I truly believe that one of the areas that we've done this uh, for our students in terms of community service, looking at issues of youth civic actions are my brother's keeper. The students have been very intimately involved in not only um, giving voice to issues that are very specific, to culturally responsive, sustaining education, but just as important, uh, giving back, being not only having mentors, but being mentors. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're connecting the civic educa education to uh, the culturally responsive and sustaining education. I think that's a um, such a critical uh, connection that oftentimes can be lost. Um, so uh, moving to Edward, Jen, and Tracy for the next question. Are we all here? Okay. Uh, Edward and Jen, from your vantage point, can you tell us about New York schools' current capacity to provide civic learning opportunities? So what have you seen? What are the sort of strengths and weaknesses across New York schools in terms of their ability to really develop uh, and deliver high quality civic learning opportunities? Anyone can jump in. You can go first, Edward. 
I was going to ask if you would like to go first. All right. <laughs> so um, to start off, right? Um, so from looking at the current capacity, uh, I think that there could be more and more be done in terms of curriculum and awareness towards students in New York City schools, well, New York schools in, 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 in total. Um, as an example, in my school, right, uh, there are resources to be provided when asked for civic education resources, right? But as a strength, I mean, as a strength, I am happy my school has the resources to provide such things, I mean, uh, such resources and have a curriculum that implements civic education, such as uh, my US government class. However, as a weakness, I, as I said before, there could be more done in terms of civic readiness for students in which awareness and the opportunities given from this curriculum should be encouraged more among students, um, not only in class, but, you know, from an outside class perspective, such as extracurricular uh, projects or activities, uh, internship opportunities, and more. Okay, so you're saying the class is there, but some additional opportunities, uh, like maybe after school activities um, and extracurriculars, would be helpful. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I can just go on and on about this because this has been on my mind. But um, I mean, yeah, in terms of extracur extracurricular activity, you know, you can have clubs, um, you know, clubs that, you know, school can sponsor to, you know, maybe have meetings with your local Congress, uh, Congress people, um, your, uh, your council members from your district, you know, more can be done outside of school. Um, but of course, you know, as of now, I see that it's great what the New York City, uh, especially here in New York City, like what they have to provide with the uh, Civic for All programs. But as I said, there's always more that can be done. So, yeah. Thank you. What about you, Jennifer, as a teacher? What have you seen? Yeah, well, I would have to agree um, uh, You know, with Edward. I uh, went to school in a very small upstate rural district with about 69 kids in my graduating class. And I teach now in a wealthy suburban uh, South Shore school in Nassau County. And I can tell you that the resources and the exposure to all things civics are not the same. Um, I was lucky that my father insisted that we register to vote and that we vote every time. Um, and that was the kind of house I grew up in with my dad always volunteering and my mother volunteering in term, you know, um, in the community. So I saw civic uh, participation as um, a part of life in America, really. But when I, but um, I didn't get that message entirely from the projects and things I was asked to do at school. And I think that um, this, I think that in all cases, um, when you have things like uh, differences in resources or access to resources, when teachers don't have the same amount of PD opportunities or the same high quality PD opportunities, professional development opportunities, um, when uh, district budgets are tight and the money goes to STEM classes and not to civics or to other things and not to um, civics, you have issues there. And lastly, I think that, you know, a community politics and where your district is in terms of um, the voters in your district uh, can really um, enhance or hinder what kind of civic education you are giving, you know, by your students. Yeah, so uh, the uneven access seems to be, um, uh, seems to be an issue. I think that point about the professional development in particular is interesting. And also, you know, as I was um, saying with Commissioner Rosa, um, when so much else is happening in the world, whether it's a pandemic, you know, issues around racial inequality, um, what is the first thing to go? And so thinking about uh, civic education as both a right and a, um, uh, and, and not, a, not the icing on the cake, but no. really a central piece of- Right, it of should education. be a necessity for sure. Indeed. So what about you, Tracy, as a parent? Hi. Um, so as a parent, um, this question is a little challenging because uh, unfortunately, um, parents don't get much of a glimpse inside the classroom, except for 
the homework that comes home or the conferences we have with the teachers or even getting more involved with SLT or PA, um, that's how you kind of get your glimpse. Um, so I'll use my background a little bit. Um, in addition to having a remote child and being in the classroom kind of this year um, to kind of answer this question. So um, under, the circum under the current circumstances, I think um, there is some capacity to provide civic learning opportunities in a sustainable manner. Um, many court decisions have noted that an adequate education should include the preparation of economically productive citizens who can actively participate in a democratic society. Uh, there is an opportunity to accomplish those ideals uh, by incorporating multicultural education um, via culturally responsive teaching, um, which by its means is a democratic student-centered pedagogy. Um, at its core, multicultural education views citizen action to improve society as an integral part of education and democracy. Um, in order to achieve this curriculum as it stands, we would need tremendous reform. Um, but this is how it can be sustainable and inclusive. Um, there's case study that has shown that culturally responsive teachers hold democratic and inclusive, culturally sensitive social relationships with their students and their mm -hmm. students' communities. Uh, this is also for connections to be made between curriculum, such as civics education, um, to students' reality. Um, thus providing an understanding of what it means to engage the democratic process. And further, students actually uh, following through to become active citizens in their community. Um, it is in this connection to one's reality that makes civics important. And through this curriculum reform, uh, this could happen for students, teachers, and guardians. Thank you. So I... I uh, couched my question in terms of you as parent. I could have said you as attorney, you as parent advocate, you as educational psychology student, so many things. So thank you for those thoughtful comments. Um, and just uh, looking to the chat, someone just mentioned that culturally responsive pedagogy is democracy. Um, so thank you for those comments. So next question goes to Professor Rebell, Commissioner Rosa, and Senator Mayer. I've been doing some wonderful reading on this topic here, here uh, lately. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Professor Rebell. So school funding and resources vary a lot from district to district. Can you talk about how New York's serious ongoing school funding disparities and educational inequities affect schools' ability to prepare their students for civic participation and how to overcome these challenges? Anyone can jump in. I'll, I'll jump in only because uh, in this, this is like the moment in time to have this discussion. Mm -hmm. in, uh, six days we should have a state budget if it was done on time and we in the legislature and you know i'm part of the senate democratic majority are fighting uh to get substantially additional funding for all of our schools throughout the state based on equitable principles of what they're owed under the cfe uh and the the principles of cfe that michael rubel got established in the court of appeals and which districts are owed in order to have equity. So one, we're in the middle, literally, of the fight to get the money that we believe is necessary. Two, we are extremely aware that the pressures of uh, communities to have civically engaged students and to have a, a curriculum and a world that reflects their worldview, this is the moment that we have to step up into that as well. And we have been fighting on our side to get civics with working with the state education department imbued into the life of students. And the one thing I wanna add is it should not be dependent on the affluence of the community, whether civics is part of the life of the student. Every student, and I think a, a number of the speakers spoke about that, should have the opportunity not only to participate civically, but even if they're not interested, to be encouraged to understand our civic life. That is the nature of a democracy. So 
as legislators who sort of are on the ground, not teachers, not, not always parents, but hearing from our constituents, this issue is, these two issues are front and center right now. And we are struggling and pushing ahead to get better resolutions. We are not satisfied with what our students come out of school feeling about their civics experience and their knowledge about education. And we're working with lots of people on this screen to try to move forward in that direction. I hope everyone heard that as a call to action. I certainly yeah. did, that this is the moment to move forward um, so that the community's affluence is not the determining factor in children's civic education. Michael, it looked like you were ready to jump in. Yes, I'd, I'd like to give some concrete examples of how the uh, shortfall in funding that we've experienced in New York State in recent years has directly affected um, opportunities for civic engagement and civic learning by our students. You know, I was uh, very privileged to chair the region's task force on civic readiness. And one of the areas we did a lot of work in was capstone projects. And the teachers, administrators on this task force uh, really worked hard to come up with a model for how all kids in New York State could really benefit from this kind of capstone project. But when we reached the point of making our specific proposal to the regions, the question came up, should every school in New York State, or at least every high school, be required to offer this opportunity? Um, not that every child has to take it, but at least they, they have the opportunity. And we held back from that concern um, mainly because of funding, because people said, you know, the schools in the affluent districts will be able to do this. But a lot of these schools in the high needs districts just are not gonna have the resources. Uh, they don't have the teaching forces. Uh, they don't have the ability to train the teachers. Uh, so it would be an unfair additional state mandate. Um, interestingly, when our proposals were sent out to the public, thousands of people responded to the state edu education department's a questionnaire about these proposals and 65% of the respondents without our prompting them said that this capstone should be required. So that's why I am really pleased, uh, first of all, that the regents for years have said we have to have full funding of the foundation aid formula. Uh, the legislature has not responded over many years, but I'm really pleased that um, Senator Mayer and uh, both houses of the legislature in their uh, proposals that'll be um, negotiated next week, both of them have made a commitment uh, to fully funding foundation aid over the next three years. And this is the kind of difference it can make. And I'll just add, Edward mentioned the Civics for All program in New York City, which is a great advance in New York City, uh, but there are only 100 New York City schools out of 1500 that get the full program. And last year, when they wanted to expand it to about uh, several hundred schools, uh, instead of expanding, they had to cut back because what's the first thing to go when, when money's short? Last year during the pandemic, civics was the first thing to go. So we've got to make it a priority and we need full foundation funding at the least to allow the schools to make it that priority. So Stephanie, I want to add uh, the fact that one of the aspects, um, as uh, Michael knows, is the seal of civic readiness, which we are very much committed to in terms of um, a seal, in terms of our diploma. But the one aspect that I wanna add besides the funding, which is critical, is the aspect that through civic, we have an opportunity to elevate during, not only during the times that we're going through, but to elevate historically um, marginalized um, communities, people of various groups, where we have told a single story, where their voices have been uh, in many ways not allowed to be part of conversations, not only in curricula, but in also taking their rightful place in various positions. So I, I do think that through, um, through this process, through civic learning, through civic engagement, it is an opportunity to learn, to also take the learning um, as our students talk about 
and turning it into what I call um, action types of activities. So it's not just learning in the classroom. How do you go and do community service? How do you, how do you engage students in town hall meetings and capstone projects and activities that allow them, as I said earlier, to give voice, but also to question uh, the lack of, in many situations, of people that look like, look like me, that look like you, Stephanie. And so elevating that historical marginalization is critical as part of this process. Um, and also, I do believe that empowering our students as agents of social change is an outcome of going through not only the learning, but also learning as critical thinkers, learning to evaluate materials, learning to evaluate sometimes propaganda and things that are out there, but also becoming active uh, participants in their own learning and owning that and then or and and then taking part in taking standards work and turning them to what I call applied learning. And it is through that applied learning that students really begin to see their role, their sense of commitment and their sense of value in these conversations. So I truly believe that it is an opportunity to also call out many of the injustices, call out and have opportunities to discuss the, the social injustices that we have and we know that many groups have experienced. So I really think it's a powerful core tool in our educational system to really correct and to and to also involve our students in creating, moving from the single story to a much more inclusive, comprehensive approach. Thank you. So just thinking about these all together, in essence, what you're saying is ironically, the most uh, marginalized communities could use the funding most in terms of, of actually getting youth engaged those youth will become adults in those communities um, and really make a difference in terms of uh, in terms of the action piece, right? So really getting engaged in their communities. Someone in the chat was just talking about um, the community uplift that comes with civic education. And uh, I really was struck by Edward's comments earlier about how he would really like to have those opportunities to be more engaged in uh, his own community and for his school to provide those opportunities. Stephanie, I, can I add for one second that we're talking about students who are highly motivated about civics like Edward, but we have to reach those who are cynical and don't believe that government has any impact on their lives and try to get at that at an earlier stage by showing the power of participation to what the commissioner was talking about, the tools to engage, to fight for what you believe in. And that is another real value of civics education, starting at the earliest grade, to encourage students to speak up, have opinions, and recognize that they can change things. We're facing a culture that has a great deal of cynicism about government, and we need to change it, and we can change it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna to move to some questions for the entire panel. All right, so the mission of Democracy Ready New York is to spur collective action, just talk about action, uh, to help ensure all New York schools can fulfill their civic mission. The webinars have focused on three critical elements of civic readiness, media literacy, discussing controversial issues, and youth civic action. Panelists and participants have recommended actions needed to deliver these important civic learning opportunities to all students. And I would like to invite you to react to some of these. Okay, so um, first, to advance media literacy, 
Uh, there were three recommendations. One is teacher education programs should require training in media literacy for all prospective teachers. Uh, the second was districts should give leadership roles for school library media specialists in delivering media literacy education and providing PD for teachers. And third, the state should require all students to take courses in media literacy for high school graduation. So media training for prospective students, um, bringing in um, library media specialists for education and PD for teachers and then also requiring media literacy courses. Any thoughts about these? Maybe Jennifer. I've, I've got something if you don't mind. <laughs> I, um, you know, the, 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 I think that creating another course that is in itself, you know, a siloed course isn't always the best way to affect change. Um, you know, in education, something this serious uh, as media literacy should really be woven into the courses of more than just, a, you know, of the social studies classroom. Mm -hmm. I think that um, it's important to consider that the skills of analysis, evaluation, synthesis, and listening to opposing viewpoints doesn't have to only be um, resting in the social studies classroom. Um, I think it would be super powerful if um, a kid in a science class who's in his earth science class, also had a earth science teacher who talked about how you have citizen scientists or, you know, or professional scientists who speak up in front of Congress or who write letters or who um, help draft, you know, legislation. I mean, that, that is some powerful stuff because not every kid likes social studies. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe it actually. And I, it's <laughs> impossible. But, but it's right, it's impossible. But I think that if we mean it, if we really mean it, and I, and I know that the folks you know here do, um, it needs to be um, enveloped into all the work that we do. I think we need them to see it from the time that they come, you know, I mean, kindergarten until they graduate, what it means to participate um, in a democracy, to to share our plural narrative, but it's a shared history, you know, um, nonetheless. And you can't just do that in the last five months or the first five months, you know, of the senior year. It's too late. Stephanie, I think uh, to, to piggyback on what Jennifer said, I think sometimes we tend to create silos and, and not integrate. Right. Uh, for example, as soon as Jennifer was, when Jennifer was speaking, I was thinking about, kids reading about the various vaccines, right? And understanding the percentages of, you know, how effective is the first one? Why is, you know, why do we only have the Johnson & Johnson is one, you know? So in, in, the, in the science area, in the mathematics area, and in, in, in all across, I think in too, too many times we take these, the, the what I call um, our schooling and teaching and learning and, create these silos rather than realizing that there's such integration this uh, we really need to get to a place that we begin to create uh, these intersections this connectivity to the various subject areas and they're all interconnected so that the media literacy in the people who are in this field can support they can act as a resource a support system for embedding and understanding and being critical, as I said, as you go through, you know, how do you develop uh, a, a critical landscape to help our students? Edward said something that was very striking to me. He said, you know, I learned about this subject, but when does he turn it into an action or when does he apply it? When does he turn it into an activity that allows him to go into the community, let's say, through community service and understand what it means to um, even be, as, as, as a senator said, even those individuals that are skeptical about government and being a participant in, in hearing the voices of those that really do not believe and bringing messages 
that can create a healthy debate. I love students that engage in town hall meetings with, you know, with doing research, looking at various ways to argue. You know, we have the mock assembly up here that our, our students uh, engage in. Those are activities that allow the students not only to read about it, to study it, but to apply it. And then apply it in a safe space that we call schools, but then go into, com into the community or go into mentorship, internships, where they really get to test, you know, that level of learning. So I would say to Jennifer's point that, that this has to be an integrated, interconnected process rather than creating another coursework, another silo, another thing that people have to take, but rather seeing it as a comprehensive way of looking at our, our democracy and the various ways that as critical thinkers, as, as our students become involved learners and finding their own voices and being participants and powerful change agents that we really give them the tools to be able to do that at a larger scale. And that's what I would submit rather than, you know, adding for us, it would be another certification, another course. I, I would submit that we really have to look at this in a very integrated way. You know, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to pick up on what the commissioner and Jen both said about integrating um, media literacy skills throughout the curriculum. Um, for that to happen, I think we really have to pay some attention to this recommendation for more library media specialists. They're the people who can not only teach students directly, um, but really can do the professional development to make sure that not only the social studies teachers, but the English teachers and the math teachers and everyone else uh, can take part in this. Uh, we actually have a regulation of the commissioner that says every secondary school in New York State should have a library media specialist. But now I come back to that subject of funding shortfalls, because since there are not enough funds, and it always seems that civic education is at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to what the priorities are, about half the schools in New York City, I know, do not have library media specialists. Uh, so this is where all these concerns come together and we talk about what we can do. We can have the kind of media literacy environment uh, that Jen is talking about, that the commission is talking about, um, if uh, Senator Mayer and her colleagues can pass that budget that they're proposing and get us the full foundation aid. If I may, um, just to jump in on integration in particular, um, you know, multicultural education um, actually does all of this. It accomplishes every one of these goals. Um, the first dimension of multicultural education is content integration. Um, and it ends off with its five dimensions with empowering um, the community um, and the students. So I would argue that multicultural education brings all of these things, the history, which is relevant to the cultures, the various cultures that may or may not be in the classrooms, um, and when a child can hear about its own culture and have that integrated into the classroom, especially when it comes to the civil rights movement, um, which is what really spurred uh, multicultural education, it will motivate uh, children to do what we are talking about today. Um, I think that's a, a, a part that's possibly missing is motivation. When people can hear about how these rights have been trampled in the past and continue to be trampled, we have several states who are passing legislation currently to wipe away um, voting rights. Um, when we can empower students with that kind of education, it will ignite them to want to go out and, and march in the streets, <laughs> so, so be it, um, peacefully um, and have a say. So uh, I will plead again to mention that uh, multicultural education really would conquer all of these things that, that we're talking about, especially integration. Um, and also um, knowledge construction is another dimension of multicultural education. And that will bring in, um, you know, you need um, library services in order to um, accomplish that because teachers can do but so much. Um, they can lean on and bring in 
um, the library personnel um, that Mr. Rebell was speaking about. Um, but I think it accomplishes all of this. It has to be relevant. It has to be relevant. It has to be reality. Um, it can't be up in the air. It can't be this possible thing that could or could not happen. We, I think we, we have concrete examples of when you don't get involved, what happens. And, and, and so, you know, there's, there, there should be no fear in also bringing parents into that and sending children home to have a conversation with their parents and bringing their parents into that because we know in New York City, you know, our voting rate is quite low. Um, and so it can be raised if we're having these conversations, not only in the classroom, but letting it spill over, let the children talk to their parents while they're in a grocery store and let the neighbors overhear this conversation happening. And, and that will help us also understand the importance of education because where would that have come from? Our schools, it comes from our schools. Our schools are, are supporting this conversation. Um, so I, I, think, I think that may be another um, aspect to consider. I just wanted to add on really quickly about what, especially what Commissioner Rosa said, um, the idea that from our current curriculum from civic education, how is it gonna be encouraged and to the students such as me, and is it encouraged for us to be able to apply that in school and outside school? Um, I like to go on the record that that really hasn't happened in my school. Um, and especially uh, throughout my high school year, and you know, when I was a freshman year, I wish I could take the class since freshman year. Um, to go on the record, I do, and I'm one of those students that enjoy history. Um, but it's the idea that was I being able to apply that or encourage to do that? I would say no. Um, you know, even in my junior year, being part of a push, um, and even in freshman, sophomore, you know, the idea that civic education could be applied throughout high school. I saw no students really being able to be encouraged but also applying that in our school and community i mean i do things but that's like apart from the school and it was not really pushed from the school so i like to go on the record to say that um if i could just say oh i'm sorry i know we're probably out of time right right Stephanie? we are but you can you can say one thing just one quick thing to edward's point and that is this um we the job i was trained to do 25 years ago is not the job i'm doing today and the requirements of my students is that they have that is that they need someone to help them process data to uh, you know uh, to analyze all these inputs that, that that they are constantly getting on their phone in their hand 24 hours a day and our job at least as i see it is to is to be you know a facilitator a project manager to encourage my students to ask important questions to deepen their knowledge and then let them go and they need to generate their own questions and that is how i found that i really engage um students in the business of becoming you know um an active citizen so so much there we talked about starting early we talked about integration we talked about the funding issues around um, uh, uh, being able to even have media specialists. Um, and we talked about bringing parents into the mix, which is exciting because like I said, that's my been my own work. Um, so the second uh, webinar was on the um, controversial issues, discussion, discussion of controversial issues. Um, so there were three um, reactions, uh, or there are three points um, to promote productive classroom discussion of controversial issues. One, districts should provide ongoing professional development and mentoring across the curriculum. Two, districts should issue guidelines to support teachers and promote best practices. And three, schools should provide parent education on the benefits of providing students with opportunities to discuss controversial issues. So what do we think here? So how are, how are we best setting schools, teachers, districts up for um, encouraging difficult conversations and therefore critical thinking and action? Well, you know, I'll, I'll chime in here because uh, I really want to uh, emphasize uh, that what we're talking about are controversial issues. And in many communities, this means that if teachers get up in the classroom and try to get students to talk about these um, uh, 
uh, sensitive issues at times. Um, sometimes there's real pushback from school boards, from parents, et cetera. And um, uh, I know in talking to many teachers throughout the state, there's a reason they hold back from doing this. Uh, they don't wanna deal with that pushback. So I think one of the most critical things here, in addition to the professional development, because teachers need to know the techniques to how to deal with students in these sensitive areas and make sure that uh, you get uh, tolerance and understanding and not racial confrontation, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond that, this is something school boards can do and need to do. And I would really appeal to all the school board members who may be listening, um, you really should sit down and actively pass a resolution that encourages uh, teachers to deal with controversial issues in the classroom and hear parents out at the school board meetings about their concerns about this. There are ways of setting parameters. You know, it doesn't have to be every controversial issue. If there's an explosive issue in the community, avoid that one. But there are plenty of other controversial issues that can get students to understand uh, what uh, building tolerance, empathy for talking with people with different viewpoints from yours really means. So this is something I think every school board in New York State can make a real difference on. Yeah, I couldn't agree with Michael Moore. That was that was that was really beautifully said. I, I, I know in Oceanside that I've been lucky. Um, the day after Columbine, I had um, my um, my tenure observation, and I had a whole thing going with posters and things I was going to do. And I took one look at my students, and I knew that couldn't be done. And this was something that was brought up in the second um, in the second. Uh, of the series in the webinar that these teachers spoke so beautifully about learning about your students and you know getting to know them and giving them what they need and they needed to process um what had happened and i think that i, I don't know that i would have felt comfortable if i had had um, a response from you know from my superintendent that was anything other than yes go ahead do what you would normally do and I don't think a lot of teachers are, um, are working in an environment where they feel, you know, a protected. And that's something that has to be discussed because we have lots of parents who send us lots of emails about how they don't want their kids talking about these topics in school and that politics in school don't mix. I just want to jump in for a minute and say, you know, one is I, I wholeheartedly agree with Michael in districts that have boards of education, uh, they need to really step into this field. This is the opportunity to be a grown up and to exercise the best of democracy, which is to say we can have civic engagement, we can have disagreement without the current tone of hostility and hatred that we see in political life. It's, it's really, we have to change that at a more uh, granular level of the way kids learn to disagree. And Edward, I so appreciate that you want to get out and do things. Um, we need many more of that, but we have districts that are absolutely in fear of taking on anything controversial, but we live in a controversial time. So we need people to model good behavior about disagreement, which is to engage in disagreement, to have civil discourse, and, and then to try to walk away without, you know, trying to be enemies for life. Uh, so I find that that would be very helpful at the board level. I also think it has to do with the leadership of a school. And I think the commissioner would agree. You can walk into a building and see where disagreement is tolerated and encouraged. And you can walk into a, a building where you see everything is sort of held down and there is no... Um, energy for, for disagreement and discourse and civic activity. So I think leadership at the principal level continues to be a very important thing in individual schools and sets a tone for what subjects are uh, acceptable subjects of dis discussion. And thirdly, if you're not willing to talk about race and ethnicity and tension in our society, uh, you know, that is, those are the issues before our society right now. And you need people who are willing to talk about it. And to Jennifer's point, it, schools were different 25 years ago, but this is the moment we're in. And we're so appreciative to have teachers like Jennifer who are willing to walk into it and say, let's talk about these things now. We cannot hide and pretend we are in the 50s. That time has passed. 
Well, uh, and, and Stephanie, I, I do think that um, to the Senator's point, I think there's a lot of fear and fear paralyzes any, any, any kind of movement that is grounded in fear um, comes, you know, becomes paralyzed. I think, uh, I think we really have to think of courageous leaders, courageous um, individuals that really can have these courageous conversations. And we need to have them. We can't, uh, we can't walk away from the fact that there are many uh, issues in language that we even use in schools and in society that we need to call out. We need to have um, ways and uh, mechanisms to have these conversations respectfully, but know that there are pain points and there are differences uh, that we're all living with and these differences can sometimes, and most of the time, inform your lens, the way you look at the world. And it's okay for people to say, you know, you may never have walked in, in my shoes, but I fully respect the fact that you understand, you have an, un, an understanding of what I go through or what I feel or what I have experienced. And then start from there and have those open conversations. If we don't teach our young people, our generation, how to have these discussions, debates, agree to disagree, have the opportunities to teach each other and to learn from each other and to do it in a way that is safe, and schools are supposed to be fertile, safe grounds for our young people to experience these issues. Then I think in many ways, we are, we are giving our young students a limited experience, a limited perspective. And believe it or not, in some ways, when they go into different communities or different, different positions or different spaces, colleges, whatever, you, they are not prepared to really engage in these tough, sometimes conversations. So I really, really think that yes, you can you can have board, you know, you can have boards of education, but you need beyond that. You know, to Senator Mayor's point and, and to Jen's point, you need courageous leaders that are willing to open up the super highway of conversations and getting us to a place that we truly can really see what tomorrow can look like when we can learn from each other, respect each other, but know that everybody has had a different experience and can share those pain points historically, as well as their own personal experience in terms of their own journey. Thank you. Uh, so important. So I, I heard that we do need policies to make sure that folks are, are headed in the right direction and there's some accountability, that we need leadership and courageous leadership, um, that we also need school boards, um, but we also need training. So um, Ann just asked the question of how teachers are learning these things. And, you know, as a psychologist myself, I think it takes tremendous practice in dialogue. And so what a treat for our students to be able to get that training and practice while they're young. Um, but I will say even at Teachers College, we are working on how to have difficult classroom conversations and how to get past that fear. Um, and so it's, a, it's such a, an important issue. So we need to turn to our third webinar on promoting youth civic action and community service. I feel like we've talked about some of these already, um, but the three recommendations were to increase access to ex experiential civic learning opportunities like community service, internships in the public sector, youth civic action in all schools and communities. Second, to allow students to explore their own areas of interest and develop projects with support, but not dictates from teachers. 
And then third, to ensure students know their right to be well prepared for civic engagement. I, I love that one, um, the empowerment piece. So, um, so that is uh, increasing experiential opportunities, allowing students uh, to explore their own interests with guidance, but not um, dictates and uh, empowering students to understand their right to civic uh, education. Thoughts about it? Uh, I am a strong advocate for that third one, uh, ensure students know their rights. I, I agree with that 110%. Um, and I mean, for example, like um, knowing that I can take one local example, the participatory budgeting, uh, for example, here in New York City, um, the idea that you are able to vote at a young age, $1 million of what you want to spend on for your community. I asked my friends before if they know this, no idea. Schools never teach that. It's the one thing in your community. Now, of course, I know people are, I mean, students, they travel from long distances and may not be in the same district as that school, but it's the idea that of being known, of, of learning that, to know that you have, you can vote something. I know you can't vote till you're 18, but, you know, you can vote in, in a great, um, in a great election, I would say, in terms of what you're going to spend on in your community. Um, and I believe number, uh, number two, which is that, teachers support but not dictate I know there's um I mean in my fair share of working with adults it's the idea of how where can you balance where it's helping them but not really telling them what to do it's always been a great area of like how much should we give that person a uh, support or you know resources but you know guide them in a correct way um but I believe that that is very important to be aware of so yeah thank you Jennifer I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these well, I've been thinking, I, I think that Edward should come, um, you know, and be in my class, or I should come to Edward's school and be in, <laughs> uh, you know, what's great is that, um, at least here in Oceanside, we have um, a piece of our government work that requires kids to do um, an informed action, and that can range, and that can range from anywhere from, um, you know, simply writing a letter to um, one, one of the representatives making call, um, to their office all the way to what we're currently working on with one of our science clubs that there's a class um, in government that is working uh, um, with a, um, a local uh, elected official to put uh, some solar panels on the um, ocean side um, landfill and they you know and the kids have been working on various aspects of that all the way from PR to speaking with uh, you know uh, with, with the elected officials to putting uh you know to figure out which of this um you know the solar panels are the best ones to put on the mound so 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 we encourage our students to get out there and do stuff because we have found and maybe um this is unique to oceanside but i find that the kids are so used to being passive receivers of information that to get them excited about engaging in civics it's got to be something that they are actually already excited about, right? And um, so we've been doing a lot of that work here in Oceanside. I encourage my students to talk all the time. I know that some of them tend to think that I uh, lean a little bit towards the left. So I always encourage, you know, all the voices. And I say a million times, it doesn't, we're all entitled to our own opinion, but not to our own facts. And we need to think about, you know, how we, um, that we're tough on ideas, but that we're soft on people. So practice that as much as I can, you know. <laughs> so You know, since we're speaking of rights, I'd just like to chime in. There's been a mention of the CFE case several times, and the Court of Appeals, our highest court, did um, uh, issue an order in, in that case that a lot more money has to be spent by the state. Um, but they did something else. Uh, they defined what the purpose of education is uh, under the New York State Constitution. And they said the main purpose of education is to provide students the skills they need to function productively as civic participants. That's a constitutional right. And I, I just want all the students out there and all the parents out there to know this because I'm always shocked that so few people know there actually is a constitutional right that every, every kid in New York State has to get a proper civic education. And if your school's not giving it to you, you have a right to ask for it. And that can be the first step in youth engagement 
in making sure that your right to a good civic education is being honored in your school. So I'm just gonna stick in my two cents worth on defining for students what that right is. And it's a tool that you can use to follow up anything you may have heard today or anything, uh, any other aspect of civic education that you think is important, opportunities that you think you need, you do have a right to them. Thank you. So we're gonna move on to our lightning round. All right. So this is all about the actions that different stakeholders take to develop all students in every school throughout New York to develop civic readiness. Okay, so back to Jen. What do teachers need and need to support civic readiness? What advice would you give to teachers to move the state towards civic readiness for all students? Okay, so obviously I talked about a professional development opportunities that happen during the school day and not at three o'clock when no one wants to be doing any PD. I hate to tell you that, Commissioner, but we're exhausted by that. Um, where they can, and we would like them to be able to sit with their colleagues and unpack those three C's and take a look at the new um, standards because, again, we can print it out, but it goes in the book bag and we really don't have the bandwidth, you know, to look at that work. Um, and it would be really awesome if we could do some more K-12 um, articulation with our, uh, you know, with, with all our colleagues, we could sit down and talk about what civic, you know, readiness looks like in kindergarten to fourth grade to sixth grade to eighth grade to, to um, seniors and then find a way to assess if they actually can do those things that, that are expressed in the standards. And I guess my advice to teachers teachers would be that their first responsibility is to the kids in their room and that you can't be afraid of what people who are um, outside, you know, are looking in are going to say when you are responding and advocating for your students. That's your job, you know. So just be brave. Just be, be brave. brave. I love it. Thank you. Tracy, what about parents? What can parents and other community members do? Um, thank you for the question. Um, initially, I don't think it's about what we can do, but rather how um, we can be engaged in the process. Um, for example, if the DOE and teachers can find strategic ways to bring guardians and communities into the conversation, um, it would highlight the importance and perhaps motivate students to act or at the very least spur thoughts about the topic and consider the role civics plays in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and then further, um, you have to unfortunately find the time that doesn't exist in the day to attend SLTs and um, parent association or parent teacher association meetings. Um, in order to invoke the importance of this um, and bring it to your principal as well. Um, that is the other way. So to be engaged and to also show up. Engage, show up, and be invited to be part of the conversation. Senator Mayer, how have you and your colleagues in the legislature been involved in moving the state towards civic readiness for all students? And what's next? Well, some specific things last year in the budget, there is a section of the state education law called courses of instruction in patriotism and citizenship and in certain historic documents. It's a little bit of inside baseball, but we got the words uh, that civic education and values our shared history of diversity, the role of re religious tolerance in this country to be included last year in the budget in that section. So when I said the budget matters in the next 10 days, that's our opportunity sometimes to get the things we really care about in there. So we got that in there. And then I've had two bills that have passed the Senate that are relevant to this, one requiring school boards to establish a peer selected student government in either a high school or district wide where none presently exist, because not every school has that. It didn't pass in the assembly, but it passed in the Senate. I have a bill that has passed uh, every year for the last three years to establish a voter pre-registration program in high school for eligible 16 and 17 year olds who can pre-register now uh, with expanded election law provisions that we adopted 
so that you're not dependent on an active parent group to come in and set up a table, but this is the school's responsibility as part of civic preparedness to get them in there. And then this year, we are really fighting to get additional language in uh, the budget that reflects our commitment to ensuring these issues of racial equity in terms of our curriculum and uh, diversity of the American experience is included, not in a single course, but embedded into the educational uh, fabric of our schools from pre-K to 12th grade. And we're working closely with the commissioner to try to find a path forward. But um, we are very, very committed to seeing that that's part of the conversation this year, as well as money. I left money out, but I started with money. So money's been money is always good. Thank you, Senator Mayor. I know you have to step off in a moment. I have really enjoyed hearing your about your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. And uh, Commissioner Rosa, what's next for NYSCB in advancing and supporting student civic readiness? Sure. First and foremost, um, my hope and my dream for our both our Board of Regents and our department is to truly, truly um, become very service oriented and knowing that we, we have to make sure that we really engage and listen to the voices of those that we are supporting. And part of that is through one, through listening, through modeling. It's important that our behavior and the outcomes really align with what we say we want to happen. The other, the other issue is uh, obviously we are constantly engaging guidance and, and that guidance has to be work that's done to change the narrative. And that, and that changing of the narrative obviously is not only looking at the issue of civic engagement, but also the issue of being culturally responsive and the issue of community involvement student engagement, all those elements have to become part of the conversation. And they have to become part of the conversation as a, a pathway to really truly have an institution that really gives um, communities, particularly communities of color um, and all communities, but those that have been marginalized, an opportunity to really be part of that narrative. It is so important that if we're in this together, we're in this together. And again, I, I reference back to the issue that we have to move away from the single story, but look at the contributions, look at beyond the contributions, the, the opportunities to learn from one another and to really value and see at the core the fact that all of us, all of us together are much, much stronger than some of us doing this work. And so I want to be able to know that uh, we represent the state and that in fact, in the representation of the state, we look around and we make sure that that narrative, the voices, of both of the people who have really made this state and this country, the, co the country that it is now, but hopefully more important, the country that it will be because our young people really are looking to place their narrative and their ancestors and all the great work that others have done that have not been, um, represented. So that is my goal and that's my uh, hope that um, our state and our regions and our stakeholders and all of us take hold of this new narrative and this new way of telling our story. Thank you. So we're having parents at the table and the community at the table and saying and, and bringing a new narrative. Thank you. Professor Rebell. Tell us about your work to ensure all students are prepared for civic participation. Well, I think uh, some of the most important work I've been trying to do in New York State is with our wonderful Democracy Ready Coalition, 
And uh, I again want to thank all our members uh, from throughout the state. We've got thousands of members through our uh, 35 organizations, individuals helped put this webinar together. And we've learned a lot. Uh, the series has been great. We've had a lot of proposals, a lot of really uh, probing insights. And I think right after this webinar series uh, concludes, uh, we're going to pull together uh, our membership from Democracy Ready, go over a lot of these ideas and see which ones of them we can pick up and uh, try to turn them into uh, concrete active proposals. And then um, go back to Commissioner Rosa, the State Education Department, go back to Senator Mayor and the legislature and see if we can get them enacted. So. Um, uh, really, what I want to do looking forward is to pull together everything that's come out of these webinars and uh, make as many of them uh, really happen as possible. Well, I, for one, am grateful for the work that you're doing. And Edward, <laughs> Democracy Ready New York's Youth Leadership Initiative is working to advance civic readiness for all, uh, for all youth. How can young people get involved? Well, where, where can I start? I mean, there's so much uh, young people can do, but, uh, but I can say the things that young people have been doing, um, you know, as you see on social media platforms, you know, you can see virtual rallies that youth are, you know, taking a stand. Um, I've been part of uh, virtual rallies myself. And, you know, it's amazing to see a lot of young people really want to voice, uh, voice out, you know, their opinions and the concerns of current, you know, current issues. And I, for myself, you know, working with other organizations, you know, as we help give them a platform, it's great. However, you know, youth not only can do social media, but, you know, they can be more involved by, you know, holding meetings or sending emails to their local officials and, you know, stakeholders that represent them and their community. And when I mean stakeholders, people who have power to make change, right? That is the people. But of course, you know, uh, like the state senators, uh, in order to push their agenda and, you know, make noise or, you know, their local uh, council members uh, and city council, you know, there's just so much you can do. As I said, there's just way too much to list off, but those are like the main ideas that I can give you. Well, thank you. Just the tip of the iceberg. And also I appreciate all that you're doing and, and such a great example to other youth. So we have just a few minutes to get to some questions from our audience. And if you've seen the chat and the Q&A, there are many. So I will start off uh, with Commissioner Rosa. As the leader of the New York State education system, how will you leverage the power of your position to ensure civic education for all students? I think that was part of my last answer, but I will uh, give a summary of the fact that I think um, I have um, an opportunity as both having been chancellor and now commissioner to really contribute and create this narrative that will help young people as Edward to empower them to think about not only their learning, but their applied portion of, of, of their learning. And um, I do think it's so important that in my role that I, be, I absolutely support, as I said earlier, the work that the schools are doing. And oh, no, I think we've lost your audio. No, okay, while you're getting the, oh, okay. While you're doing the audio, um, let me turn to uh, Professor Rebell. Do you believe there's a correlation between low vo voter turnout of 18 to 25 year olds on the local, state, and national elections and civic engagement in schools? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I think that there have been uh, numerous studies uh, that have shown that students who are active in school in the way Edward was saying that he would like to be, uh, students who take part in extracurricular activities, uh, they do vote more often and more early. Uh, so uh, there's a definite tie-in, yes. Stephanie, can you hear me now? No. I'm thinking that the, the problem may be with Stephanie's audio. Now yeah, we can, we can hear you loud and clear. I believe it might be yeah. from her end. Yeah. 
And so, so Commissioner when, Rosa, why don't you finish your answer? I think you got cut off. In no, the only thing I was going to say, and I was going to take this proud moment to address Edward by saying, Edward, today I have a, a total surprise. He texted me this morning, came all the way from, he's actually was one of my students at 218, as I said to Michael, and um, used to participate in town hall meetings at 218. We used to have these debates. So this is applied learning from 1996, 97. Yeah. And he now lives in um, I was Scottsdale, Arizona in a phenomenal position. Um, and I'm gonna pull him over so he can, you know, you could see him. Hi. So he came here today to, he found me. He came here today uh, to really just basically uh, say thank you for having been his principal way back and to really be uh, continue to do his great work as you will as well in your rightful place in society. So when when Stephanie talked about, you know, what do we what do I do as a commissioner? It's also what do we do at a different level as a teacher, as a principal, as a superintendent to touch the lives of our young people so that they can take the rightful place and, and make a difference. All right, Stephanie, are you back hearing us? I uh, don't think so, Michael. Okay, it looks like uh, she's not. Um, so we've only got a couple of more minutes and um, uh, I don't have the questions in front of me, but what I do know is that um, this is gonna be an active dialogue. Those of you who have questions that haven't been answered um, please make sure they're in the chat. Uh, we're going to contact you by email uh, uh, to uh, uh, give you some readings, uh, to give you an opportunity to have recorded copies of these sessions. And uh, there's also going to be a survey. So we want to hear your input. And um, it is going to make a difference. Um, as I say, our Democracy Ready group includes the teachers union, includes the superintendents, the school boards, many of the oh. advocates throughout the, the uh, state, many of the youth groups. Um, so we wanna continue an active dialogue with all of you who have been watching this webinar series. And we're pleased uh, as can be that we've got uh, a commissioner like Commissioner Rosa, uh, the staff working at SED and uh, leading legislators like uh, Commissioner, like uh, Senator Mayer who are really um, uh, on wavelength with us on these issues. So I think here in New York State, there's a lot we can do. Um, and I, uh, I just want to, uh, again, uh, commend the commissioner and the regents for having restated what the purpose of education is in New York State. Most states say the outcome of education should be making kids college and career ready. In New York, our regents and our commissioner have made it the official policy that kids should be college, career, and civically ready. And uh, all of us can work toward that end. So thank you all for watching and um, good evening. <laughs>